Hello. Welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very excited to bring the conversation I had with the wonderful William Eggington. William is an author and educator. He is the Decker Professor in Humanities and Director of the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute at Johns Hopkins University. His main interests are in literature, philosophy, and the history of science. And he is the author of the latest book, The Rigor of Angels, Borges, Heisenberg, Kant, and the Ultimate Nature of Reality. And that is what we talk about in this conversation. We start by talking about why these three individuals and why the nature of reality. We talk about the role of interpreting uh, the thought and writings of uh, these three men. We talk about different tools to ask big questions about space and time and reality. We talk about the origins of reality, aspects of change, uh, Hume's impact on Kant and his thinking and the self, the importance and power of theory for understanding science, and whether reality really exists. Um, I have to say this conversation was really awesome to have. Um, Of course, uh, William's work is... Um, wonderful, and the book is absolutely fantastic. As I say in the conversation, um, it it's so uh, inspiring and, and and really just interesting how he was able to take uh, one of the biggest uh, physicists and really talk about quantum mechanics. He was able to talk about Borges and about poetry, uh, and then you know Immanuel Kant and his. Uh, philosophy, which can be pretty dense, and he explains this in the book and integrates them and shows that to understand the nature of reality, it's not just from physics, it's not just from cognition or philosophy, uh, and it's not just from poetry literature, it's all of those things that help us understand the nature of reality. Um, And he weaves it in such a way that makes it seem like you couldn't understand it unless you understood it from those different Uh, multidisciplinary perspectives and um, it just I walked away from the conversation reading the book and and talking with him of this why aren't we doing this more or why aren't we doing more of this of this integration of physical sciences social sciences arts and humanities we need all of it and all all of us as humans in, in different ways are trying to figure this out and he just does a masterful job uh, of showing the integration here, um, and he's he's quite wonderful, and just a great communicator, a great speaker, a great writer, and great thinker. So, um, as always, you can find this conversation at Converging Dialogues at Substack.com. I'm also over there on YouTube. Subscribe, follow, share widely, and uh, now I bring you William Eggington. I am here with William Eggington. Uh, William, thank you so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, very much looking forward to talking with you about your uh, new book. It's a pleasure, and thanks so much for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, so you're you got a new book coming out, The Rigor of Angels, uh, Borges, Eisenberg, Kant, and the Ultimate Nature of Reality. It is fantastic. I probably consumed this in two sittings, three sittings max. Uh, I've even dog-eared it. I've underlined it. I mean, I really had a blast with this book. And I, you know, sometimes we get these books and, and you don't know what you're getting into. I find something that looks cool. It seems interesting. And it's like, well, let's see how it goes. And then this one just kind of grabbed me and didn't let go. So it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's a very good book. Wonderful to hear. Thank you so much for those kind words. Xavier. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So just tell us real quick, a brief snapshot, uh, you know, who you are academically, professionally, and uh, what you're currently up to. Absolutely. So I'm a professor of literature and and thought at uh, Johns Hopkins University, where I've been running for the last seven years, the Alexander Grass Humanities Institute. I'm a professor and currently chair of modern languages and literatures at the same university. I uh, got my degree, my PhD, uh, at the end of the 90s at Stanford University in comparative literature, Mm -hmm. and have always had an interest in really deep interdisciplinary stuff. So uh, where philosophy and literature and ultimately science cross paths. Um, the stuff that I've been doing on cosmology and and foundations of physics, which is a subcategory of philosophy, I've been dabbling in and interested in for a long, long time as a, as a, you know, even before I went to college, I was really more a math and science kind of guy and then got 
diverted into philosophy and literature in college, never turned back. But I brought those interests along with me and um, and they, they never left. So mm. in graduate school, I studied uh, some of the, the the figures who ended up playing big a big role in this book. Uh, so in some ways, you could say this book has been germinating for, for mm. 30 or close to 30 years. Mm. Um, in the meantime, I since I can teach whatever I want, which is a marvelous, marvelous <laughs> benefit. Uh, very nice. It's very nice. <laughs> yeah, I come around to it every once in a while. I teach courses that have been called, for example, the Cosmic Imagination, or one that I'm teaching for first year students at uh, at Hopkins um, this coming fall: Poets, Physicists, Philosophers, and the Ultimate Nature of Reality, which you'll probably recognize from in some version of in the uh, subtitle to the current book. So I've been teaching about these topics and thinking about them for a long time. And then uh, a couple of years back, I pitched the idea for a new big uh, trade book to my agent, and he thought it was wonderful. We went back and forth, but I needed to come up with, I mean, because yeah, as you know, as you know, the ideas are huge. And yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. the range of the book is really, frankly, thousands of years. It goes back as far as the pre-Socratics and, and up to 20th century physics. So how do you encapsulate the story that I'm trying to tell? How do you convey it? What's a, what's an appropriate vehicle for it? And I needed to find three characters. Mm-hmm. And I went back and forth. It wasn't didn't have to be three. It ended up being three. And at first, I had a, a an outline that included like 12 different characters oh. um, at different points in history. And then at another point, I said, no, no, this has gotten a little bit out of hand. Then I narrowed it down and cut, tried to, to focus on one and tell the story all through one person, which could have worked well. But then, you know, maybe it was too focused. And then I thought, well, you know, threes works really well. You can braid it, uh, braid the stories together. Um, uh, it reminded me of a, a book that is a classic for me and its structure, I mean, and, and for probably many of your listeners as well, Gertel Escherbach um, uh, by the great Hofstetter. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, so I said, well, maybe maybe I'll go with three. And who could those be? Well, it definitely has to be three people from completely different fields. And then it hit me. <laughs> Ten years ago, I had published a little piece, very small in comparison, in the New York Times in the uh, philosophy forum called The Stone. And um, I went back and looked at that, and I talked specifically about these three characters. One, oh, there it is. One, there it is. One was a philosopher, and one was, of course, the founder of, of quantum mechanics. And I said, that's it. Uh-huh. This book has to really focus in on those three characters. And that's when I started writing it. And uh, then it was a you know a two- to three-year struggle to, to really get the into the essence of the characters, to weave these stories together, to find the right the right rhythm. Because, of course, the idea is to get to that central idea, the fundamental nature of reality. But this can't just be a book that's telling readers what the fundamental nature of reality is. That sort of would violate the whole idea of the book. So it really had to be about conveying the enormousness of these of these questions through individual lives and through the struggles of these individual characters. And so that's that's how it came about. Yeah, it's 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 incredible because I mean, Again, I, I've read a handful of things, so I'm no physicist. I'm not a philosopher formally. I'm certainly not a poet. But you know, just from someone that's kind of read about these folks or read about these topics, it seems like you treated the topics very well. Like you do a, a good amount of uh, explaining of you know general relativity and quantum mechanics, and you talk about uh, different types of uh, philosophy and German idealism, and you know, it's it's, it's really. Uh, impressive how you're able to you know kind of tackle these big 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 themes but as you said they're all kind of focused around this idea of of reality so i have two questions here yeah tell us about the the central question of um you know the nature of reality reality you know what is real what isn't you know that's such a big question and using um, which doesn't really have any answers in some ways, um, or I guess it has different answers depending on who you ask. And you're using different fields of discipline, which is great because we need more of that. We need more of an uh, interdisciplinary approach, which is fantastic. But also of how you uh, organize the book, which is in uh, four parts, and they're after four um, uh, four of Kant's, uh, what are they called? Antinomies. Antinomies, thank you. Um and so the first, you know, the first part is space and time. Are they divisible or are they chunks? Which is, uh, 
which is a it's a really clever way of kind of going through it. And so each chapter, as readers can imagine, is about each of the characters or the, the figures here. So I guess why the nature of reality? For these three guys in different fields, why did you decide this question to kind of get at? Really, the let's start with the title of the book, actually. And um, because the title of the book kind of explains why I fell into the problem that I fell into or dove down the rabbit hole that I did. The title of the book is, a, is an allusion to a beautiful line and an exquisite line by, by Borges, the great Argentine poet, who is the poet in this, um, in this triumvirate of, of, of thinkers. And he wrote a story called Tun Ukbar Orbis Tertius in the 1940s. And, uh, and the, the story is mysterious. It's gorgeous. It's uh, it's a story that sometimes when I teach it, I preface it by saying this is probably the single best short story ever written, if you're asking my humble opinion. Um, but it's but and one of the reasons why it's so great is it, it sucks you in and you every single time you read it, you can't get enough of it. And, and you and you it causes you to ask questions and to come back to them over and over again. But in this story, which, as I said, he published in the beginning of the 1940s, he ends it with a postscript. But the postscript is dated to 1947, which is uh, several years after he wrote the story and also after the world conflict, which was going on at the time that he was writing the story. Um, and in that um, in that postscript, he makes this this allusion uh, to uh, what will eventually be the title of my book, The Rigor of Angels, in the context that it comes from, which is also an epigraph to the book, is he's talking about humanity's um, entrancement with uh, uh, the idea of the world having a certain rigor. Uh, what he means by that is that humanity explores the world and is amazed to find the beauty of mathematics in it, is amazed to find that rules seem to um, pre-exist us and 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 order and reason seem to pre-exist us and what borges says in this quote is as follows humanity forgets and forgets again that the rigor it finds out there in the world is a rigor, rigor of chess masters and not of angels mm. um a rigor of chess masters what he means is we apply the rigor um but then we conveniently forget that we did so uh the rigor that we put into the world is a rigor that's necessary for us to, in fact, be exploring the world. Uh, it, it is what essentially Kant will call the conditions of possibility of something being found the way that you find it. it. It's not out there in the world, but it's a necessary condition of our cognizing something in the world. And yet we forget and forget again, according to Borges. It's almost necessary, this forgetting. We forget the role that we play in constructing the very necessary tools that we need to find in order to and we need to use in order to find the, the way that the world is. Mm -hmm. So the idea here is, and that's what made me have to bring Kant into the, uh, into the equation, uh, that the, we're never going to understand ultimately what reality is in and of itself. Why? Because we're knowers and knowers can't come to know the world as it is in, in, in itself because we have to use the tools that are there at our discretion that are available for us to do so. These are cognitive tools. They're logical tools. Um, they could be even metaphysical tools. Uh, they're the tools of an embodied creature. All of the above are true, but they're going to be tools. And this is finally to bring in the third thinker, what Heisenberg ultimately gleaned from the many and extraordinary, both scientific and ultimately philosophical debates that he was having during the late 20s, very much during the 30s, with people like the great Albert Einstein, with the great Irvin Schrodinger, um, and the uh, debates that then continued uh, uh, for decades after among the various partisans, and in some ways still divide uh, the world of physics today, uh, which is this idea are we using mathematics and science and observation to discover things that are as they are out there in the world themselves? Or are they our way of explaining how the world reveals itself to creatures like us with the tools that we have at our, um, uh, that are available to us? And Heisenberg came down very, very firmly on the second, on the latter. And he said, we have to remember because we always forget. We forget, forget again that what physics is, what science is, is not a revelation of the world. It's a re revelation of the world as it reveals itself to our instruments of observation. Oh, yes, it's so nicely put. I, I firmly agree. And it's this last question that really bothers me mm -hmm. <laughs> as I wrestle with this, mm -hmm. it, which is just that. And 
but I, I want to say one thing about this is that one of the things that's nice about the book and understanding one of the most fundamental things about you know reality and about us is it can't we can't try and figure these things out as humans only by mathematics mm-hmm. only by cognition right mm-hmm. um it's also revealed in art right it's also revealed in and how we understand various mediums and forms of art whether that's poetry or literature or film uh you know good film uh you know things like that like there's there's a there's something that we can't always explain whether it's through the phenomenological or whether it's through the human condition and that has a a way of unveiling itself for us when we put it into a medium like that and 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 having all of those players kind of you know peeking over each other and saying like well you, this is the angle you see it from and this is the angle right. i see it from and they each have value and merit i think you can get closer to understanding the nature of reality by doing that and and to me that's what i think the book does uh is it shows that i have to imagine though on that point th- these folks were in different times though and they weren't mm-hmm. obviously in dialogue with each other at least directly obviously so how do we how do we understand or have, I guess, um, this is always my, the interpretive side of things always kind of gets into me as well as how do we, how do we accurately or try to cl- as closely as we can get to understanding what someone like Kant meant or Borges mm-hmm. meant or, or even what, what scientists, what they were really trying to get at where we're not putting 2023 20, eyes into this and making it what we want it to be. Right. Uh, we could have application for now, but how do we understand the essence or the, the qualities of what they're trying to get at? And then we find the application. How do you how do you how do you find that with with these guys? We have a great advantage with the, the characters that I ended up choosing to tell this story. And one is one is um, they're not as distant in time from us as, say, Boethius would be, who is the mm. uh, the great early Latin thinker who also plays a a big role in this, has his own little place in one of the chapters, or much uh, much worse, someone like um, uh, uh, Zeno, uh, who we only Zeno of Elia, who we only hear about through uh, Plato's dialogues, who's at 2,500 years before us, um, people whose ideas we get a grasp of, but only because they've been filtered or interpreted through uh, through so many others. So the modernity, in particular, of Kant and Borges is extremely important. I mean, not kind of, of the modernity of Borges and Heisenberg is extremely important. Uh, on the one hand, I mean. I, my life overlapped with uh, with with both Borges and, and, and Heisenberg. Uh, Borges died in the mid '80s. Heisenberg in the, in the mid to late '70s. Um, so these are not historically figures that are so far away. Uh, the other um, uh, great advantage is that um, none of the three really lacked for. Um, shall we say, garrulousness. They, uh, they, <laughs> they wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. So we get a lot of kind of repeat versions of what they're trying to get at. Uh, the, the big interpretive question um, is often very, you know, very often as you, you began your question talking about art and, um, and, and literature is about what, um, what the poet means, right? Because the poet isn't telling you something straight in some ways, right? right. So there, there are really robust conversations to have about the, um, you know, the ultimate meaning of a Borges story, or if there is even such a thing as the ultimate meaning of a Borges story, right? A Borges story is, is obscure. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's filled, it, it begs for multiple interpretations. And I get that. And, uh, and, and, and I agree with that. Um, however, this is the interpretation that Borges's work as a whole has pulled out of me, right? Out of my readings of it. And my job as someone writing about Borges and about the sum total of his work is to convince you as the readers that that this is a, a really good interpretation. I don't need to say it's the only interpretation because what am I making the argument? What's the argument that I'm making? This is an interpretation about our nature, uh, 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 the nature of our understanding of reality that was provoked in me by reading Borges, right? So it's not even so much the, as the ultimate question is, yeah, but is this really what Borges meant? In some ways, my answer would be, it kind of doesn't matter because what he meant for me allowed me to make these arguments and try to convince you that this 
this big metaphysical question needs to be answered in the following way. What's one possible proof of concept for me? One of my, my favorite stories to tell about the process of writing this is obviously my training, I told you at the beginning, is in comparative literature. I'm very into math and science, but I'm, a, I'm an amateur, uh, uh, hopefully a very informed amateur, but, but, but one who, in the etymological sense of the word amateur, one who loves mm. what, he's, what he's reading about and thinking about. Um, so how do my arguments about foundations of physics measure up Given the fact that I'm not a physicist and not a mathematician, I've got some knowledge in that area, I've got some training, but I'm really coming at this as someone who read some Borges stories and started to think in a certain way. Um, well, uh, my editor uh, also edits uh, uh, Brian Green, the great, um, great. Uh, string theorist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I hope Brian's not listening to this, but <laughs> certainly not a diss in any way. If he, if, if he is, I adore him. And I've had him down to, uh, to Hopkins. And we have some really robust uh, disagreements about the nature of free will. Um, but, but you know, my editor once said, um, you know, what surprised me in reading this book by a literary critic is how much it taught me about physics. Mm. Um, and and so that was that was great for me. The second proof of concept is that um, I had been thinking and writing uh, about this stuff for a long, long time before I came around to reading um, one of the key, shall we call them, interpretations of quantum mechanics, which is by the great Italian um, um, uh, theorist Carlo Rovelli, mm, uh, yeah. also a great exactly. thinker and philosopher in his own right. Mm -hmm. And it's what we call the relational, or what he also called the relational theory of mm -hmm. uh, the relational interpretation of quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. And my claim is that reading Borges and Kant led me to the relational interpretation of quantum mechanics before I read Carlo Rovelli. Uh, mm. Now, again, that doesn't take anything away from Rovelli. I adore Rovelli. I cite him all over the book. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm trying desperately to get him to come to, to Hopkins. He's a hard guy to, to pin he's down. Quite busy. <laughs> he's, he's got, he's got the, the first and, and a blurb and on the front of my book is from Rovelli, and I'm delighted to have that. It's a huge honor for me. Uh, but again, I came to that insight not as a physicist, uh, as a, a reader, in this case of literature, in this case of Borges, and and that to me is the power of this, you know, mm. what I'm going to do here, mm. that you can come to certain fundamental understandings of the relationship between the human and reality, which is really the domain of physics to uh, uh, to explore, but you can do so not from the perspective and learning of a physicist exclusively, but from someone interested in telling stories. Yeah, I, I firmly agree with you because I, I I see it as if we just have physics or we just have philosophy, we're not getting the full picture of what it means to be human. And you need a lot of these other aspects, like we were talking about various arts, you know, literature, or poetry of sorts, that fill it in and, and, and bring it more uh, to have a robust framing and picture. And so I think in that way, obviously, with a tremendous amount of respect that you have for uh, these disciplines and many of the people you listed, it's then saying, okay, I respect that and I can I can do my homework on this, but my point of view or my my perspective here is through this lens. And we can understand many of the same things, but in a different frame. If people want to read Brian Greene and get all the nuts and bolts about it oh, or, or whomever, I highly, absolutely highly recommend it. Yeah. Right. Great. That's that's fantastic. I mean, I've read most of his books. He's great. But you know, he's he's coming from a different perspective. And I think that as long as there's, which obviously you have, and, and I think many other folks do, is a respect for the disciplines and the science. And okay, but then you show the perspective that is giving uh, a kind of uh, a, another layer of kind of bringing it to life of sorts. I think that that's, again, I think that's super, super necessary. One thing, if you don't mind me adding a footnote yeah, to that, yeah, that I yeah, think yeah. is extremely important to add, is that the physicists at this point, literally all of the physicists that we've mentioned, right? And we go back to the, be they uh, the classic uh, early 20th century guys who disrupted the history of thought of, of, of our, our scientific thinking altogether, Einstein, Schrodinger, uh, 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 Heisenberg. The hero of, uh, of you know of the scientific side of the story I'm telling, or the modern ones, the Carlo Rovelli, the the Brian Green. Let me add another to that, Marcelo Gleiser. These guys are not only extraordinary scientists, extraordinary physicists. They are also humanists. They also read deeply, yeah. and think deeply, and they think about philosophical problems and they know the history of thought. And one of my explicit and implicit art, uh, arguments throughout this book is that is salutary for the practice of science. Mm 
especially for the practice of the kind of science that's going on in these in these corners of the world, right? That these these big questions and this um, and and quite frankly, this engagement and exposure to thought, to literature and the arts helps scientists as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would I would certainly agree. So let's let's talk about some of the the concepts here, um, and we can we can just kind of get them kind of you know kind of generally. Um, and you can go off in, in whichever ways with examples if you want. But, you know, one of the things you're talking about was was tools. And I, in the first part of the book, you know, and talking about, you know, space and time and all these things, you know, one of the things I noticed with Borges, it was about words and language. Those are the tools he used to try and understand this. You know, with Kant and obviously with with many of the, the Greek philosophers, ancient Greek philosophers, it was cognition, human experience to bring about change and how do we understand change. And then with, with um you know, Heisen, Heisenberg gets power of observation and those tools to then look at relationships between things. How do, how do people with whatever their their skill set is in, in terms of whether it's their discipline or, or or ways in which they're seeing the world, how do they how do we how do we we use different tools to ask the same question and then right. find somewhat different perspectives there? It's a great question. Let me let me kind of enter this one by talking a little bit more about Heisenberg. Um, Because Heisenberg's discoveries came directly from observations, but then furthermore, from thinking deeply about those observations and and trying to use mathematics to explain uh, those observations. And he kept on running up against a a roadblock uh, that just uh, that wouldn't resolve itself. And the roadblock kind of in a nutshell, we don't have to go deeply into it. It's, it started with um, an extraordinary discovery in 1925. Um, it was repeated in a way with uh, uh, the discovery in 1927, the paper in 1927 that led to the term that's been uh, translated in English as, as, as uncertainty. Um, and that has, you know, really sort of stamped its name on his um, or its name on his name for eternity in a way. But uh, he won the Nobel Prize for the 1925 uh, uh, discovery. And that discovery and that equation, as Ravelli beautifully points out in one of his recent books, really already carries um, uncertainty w- along with it. Uh, uh, so the uncertainty principle, as your listeners probably know, basically states that you what once you, you can measure one um, uh, characteristic of a particle uh, in motion with amazing accuracy. You can bring the delta down to zero, essentially. But if you do so, um, the other, it's it's opposing uh, uh, value. So in the famous case, it's momentum and um, uh, position. If, if you know exactly the momentum of a particle, you're going to know literally nothing about the position, right? And if you know uh, exactly the position of a particle, you know literally nothing about uh, about the momentum. The same relationship um, holds for uh, energy and time. Mm. Well, uh, but this actually flows from um, his very careful observations, which took place at the time through spectrographic analysis of uh, of energy essentially radiating through um, through uh, simple atoms um, and uh, something that Bohr had been working on for some time. And, you know, there are curious uh, outcomes when they're trying to find where electrons are. Right. So they're and they're using the spectrographic analysis and 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 then trying to take the data and crunch the data, essentially. And what Heisenberg was and everyone at the time was running into was, um, well, if you measure for one thing, you can it changes the outcome of what you're measuring the second time. Uh, and it does so anytime you do it. You're always going to end up changing the outcome. And so the the way that this translates mathematically is that it breaks a fundamental rule of mathematics, which is commutability or in certain operations. In this case, it was the operations um, um, essentially uh, 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 putting in putting starting and finishing observations of where you're suspecting and what your the values you're suspecting for a fundamental particle measuring one and then your outcome changes every time you measure the beginning right? right so what what heisenberg was trying to resolve was what he's trying to work out mathematically is he created essentially recreated a new version of, uh, an old version of mathematics matrix al- algebra in order to calculate these and he found one way or the other every time he threw in the values the first time they changed what they were going to be on the second time two years later he resolved this into a very very simple uh, expression uh, which is the 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 famous uncertainty uh, um, principle or the um, the, the uncertainty equation, which says the outcome of this is that you precisely can't, right? Because anytime you measure in on one value, the other one is going to uh, is going to become completely uncertain. So he's doing this through highly sensitive 
operations and measurements. But at the same time, he and his friends are, uh, and, and I say literally friends, but they're they're colleagues in circles, and they're going to conferences and talking with each other, and they're they're thinking about these problems, and they're they're throwing thought problems at each other. The word in, in German, because it's also happening in Germany, is Gedanken Experimente, uh, so thought experiments, and they're 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 coming up with scenarios, and they're working this out logically. So what are they doing? They're telling stories, mm-hmm. right? using operations, but they're also telling stories. They're using language to delve into the meaning of the observations that uh, that they're coming up with. And out of those stories, they're trying to draw solid principles about the nature of reality, which means they're doing philosophy. Mm-hmm. So everything is already happening in, in, in that one discipline. The poetry side is taking place in the form of the stories that they're telling. The observations are obviously the raw material and the data, data for what they're trying to discover. And out of that, you're trying to establish general principles, which are uh, those of philosophy. So just taking one of the three braids, the scientists in particular, you find all of those forms of thought are, are not only there and present, they just don't happen to be there. They're there by necessity. Yeah. And I, I find that that's super interesting because, you know, with the uncertainty principle, one of the things when I first read this years ago, <clears throat> was if at the smallest level of what we can observe and even other things we can observe, we're realizing that nothing's ever quite the same. It's always mm-hmm. a little different. As soon as you do it, like you were explaining, one way it changes the other way. And it reminds me of the famous, you know, or I guess the infamous, the famous thing that uh, Heraclitus said about if you step, you don't can't step in a river, same river twice. And this eternal kind of becoming right. of how are we always, there's always this kind of change and movement, nothing's really static. And I find that there's a lot of, power in that uh, mm-hmm. or potentially power because you know if if the if the smallest bits of of the universe or of matter or things that we know are never quite the same you can scale that all the way up for the human experience right of saying yeah. i can go to the same destination you know two three four five you know, 20 times it's always a different experience right you know right. It does, it, it's never the same and there's there's something really I don't know if you want to get really like, you know, uh, fancy here. I mean, you could be, it's very magical in that way. There's a beautifulness of, to, to that. And I think that there's a interesting kind of uh, dynamic in where all of these things, as you said, kind of live together, which I guess is kind of about sort of the, the second kind of main thing or main major theme in, in the book, which is this idea of, well, how, where does all this like kind of come from? Is it a supreme being? Is it conditioned mm-hmm. by something else? Do we do the first cause kind of argument? Mm-hmm. And how did these guys think about, uh, you know, how we understand how this stuff gets started? Uh, in 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 the middle of the book, you talk about you know Kant bringing morality into his philosophy. Mm-hmm. Warhead's talking about is there a sense of self within space? How do we understand, I guess, somewhat, I guess, of origins and then maybe, I guess, you know, some of these kind of uh, topics as well about ideas of how to live or or one one way in which is, you know, respect for things like that? So let's start with, uh, this is a great question again, but let's start with Heraclides, um, whom you mentioned, and this mm-hmm. idea of everything is change. Uh, what the figures in each of their different way in, in my book facing that claim would say is, all right, let's take that at face value and imagine that everything is changed all the time. Now, if everything is changed all the time and you are part of that everything is changed all the time, how do you even know? (laughs) How how do you recognize change as change? So I'm giving in a very kind of simplistic way, ultimately what becomes a logical argument that's the foundation for everything that Kant does. There's another side which comes along and says, well, of course, change, you know, change is only there and is only even possible because there's one big thing that never changes itself. And that's being right. It's the one. This is what the pre-Socratics said. And hence, all change is an illusion. And they had their their great hitman, Zeno, out there knocking off every single argument for uh, any for any kind of um, permanence. Mm -hmm. So you have that. uh, 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 you know, for for uh, Zeno saying motion is itself for impermanence. I mean, motion is impossible uh, because it falls into um, into paradox every time that you try and 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 work it out. So, what do think? What does a thinker like Kant do with that? Um, 
and and what and what is it that makes what is the insight that Kant has that makes him ultimately be for me the pivot he's a historical pivot in a way right but if we make a triangle in this book and we have two figures in the 20th century one a scientist and one a poet what combines them or what brings them together in the history of thought is that they're both great readers of Kant as well and they're both influencer of a relationship with Kant uh, even though they didn't know each other and didn't read each other at all. So what Kant realizes, and this is what he calls it around 1770, um, and what he refers to as his Copernican revolution, his Copernican moment, is he says, what, what philosophy needs to be doing and what kind of splits this Gordian knot is uh, we realize that we can't say with, you know, about the world that everything always is changed, but we also can't say that everything always is the one. But what we can say is that there is a condition for possibility for any kind of a knowing subject to see change at all. And that condition of possibility is that it has a kind of pivot, that it acts as this pivot that can be both present at the before and at the after. And even if it can't come along following itself and seeing itself doing that thing, there have to be these anchors along the river, and that's the term that, uh, that Kant uses, along the banks of Heraclides River. These anchors, we may never find them ourselves because everything that we actually look at is going to be changing. <laughs> but we can realize that there's a condition of possibility for us comparing one moment in time to the next, and that is that there be something like this stability. And then Kant said, and that's the key for my entire system. Because these moments of stability that are conditions of possibility for perceiving anything in the first place have their analogs in aesthetics and in ethics. Um, uh, in, and, and ultimately, the, the very positing of something like a free being who's not caught in the flow of the river is what accounts for the entire ethical system in Kant um, and what accounts for his ability to say, really, you have to treat other human beings as ends in themselves. Because if other, otherwise, you're treating them and yourself as just stuff in the river. And we know from the metaphysics that I've just performed that we can't just be reducible to stuff in the river because we perceive the river moving. And if we perceive the river moving, that means that in some way we have to constantly posit some aspect about ourselves that is not part of that moving river. Mm. How does this, this will come up a little bit later too, but Borges has this idea of this understanding of to have a self. And, yeah. and I'm curious here. Yeah, what 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 you think or 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 how you interact with these these uh these these thinkers of the self because for most people the self is an illusion right. uh, or we act under the assumption of you know that there's somebody inside pulling the levers or driving the car but really there's you know we a lot of people think that way but a lot of the times that's not the case we're more right. of a conglomerate of ideas and experiences things like that so how do you view i guess the self and, and what Borges was up to or or how we kind of go further with that idea of uh, the perceptual kind of things for this idea of a, of a self. Well, we can, we can, you mentioned Borges, you mentioned Kant. I can talk a little bit about both of them because they came to very, very similar um, mm. uh, reactions. They came to very similar conclusions on the base of very similar challenges. Um, and we'll call that challenge something along it. I think it's the simplest way of approaching this is through Kant and his relationship to David Hume, the mm -hmm. ultimate skeptic. But we can also uh, do it through, you know, Borges' own uh, trajectory, uh, where uh, he, he wrote early essays about the what he called the nothingness of personality. And he was really beset by this extreme anxiety of uh, uh, faced with the notion of, you know, that maybe the self is nothing but um, this concatenation of moments that, um, that, that otherwise has no consistency do it whatsoever but as i said i can start with hume because i think that's such a it's 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 such a clear and gorgeous argument mm -hmm. it's one that shook uh, the foundations of kant's thoughts and, and as he famously said uh reading hume awoke woke me from my dogmatic slumber mm -hmm. and what he meant by his dogmatic slumber and i think i make the point in the book that one of my when i was first uh, by a uh, undergraduate philosophy pr professor uh told about kant's um reaction to reading hume he very dryly said you know that the, that that uh, awakening Manuel Kant from his dogmatic slumber was the worst thing that David Hume ever did because it <laughs> subjected the rest of us to the horrors of having to read Kant for the rest of our lives. 
Yeah. And the, the point there being not that Kant's a bad philosopher, which he's certainly not, but that Kant can be a little dry and hard to read. Oh, and so yes. a, lot the effort, a lot of the effort in my book is trying to coax people along in that and and, and give them a, a sense of the beauty of Kantian philosophy without necessarily having to have them do the work of reading, sloughing, sloughing through a thousand pages of the critique of pure reason in order to, to get there. So the challenge that really that ultimately you know shook Kant's uh, foundations, as I said, was Hume saying essentially, and this really depressed the heck out of Hume. He was already very morose to begin with, but he uh, he said there is absolutely no way that we can know uh, anything other than the momentary uh, impressions. Uh, that we uh, are faced with. Everything else that we think is certainty uh, is merely habit. It's just accumulation. It's sedimentation of habit. There's no science. There's no math. There's no ultimate truth. There is just flash in the pan one after the other. And any sense that we have of continuity or permanence there is uh, is rubbish. It's a, it's, it's a heuristic, nothing else. Uh, worse than a heuristic. It's, a, it's an illusion. Uh, we can't be sure of anything else. And Kant read this and he said, geez, that's, that's really tough. What am I going to do with this? Because everything that I'm trying to do, you know, to, 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 to put philosophy on this, on this solid ground of reason. And I, I can't, I can't deal with this. Right. So and then he thought, and he, that's why, you know, he took many, many decades to ultimately put it together. But when he did, he did it in an extraordinary, elegant and decisive way. And it's a way that, that Borges then echoes through his own storytelling. And is when, when he talks about the idea of the self, what Kant basically says, is that, ah, well, if you think that everything is an impression, one impression of the uh, after the other, uh, in, in, in order to actually establish that, something has to, in fact, uh, remain the same. Something has to synthesize between two moments. Um, because otherwise, all there would be is a, a unity of an impression and nothing else. But a unity of impression at one particular, what I would call an infinitely slim uh, a sliver of space time, is nothing. It doesn't have a before or after to uh, uh, to compare with. It doesn't have a, a sense of self to span from one moment to the next. So the self at the most basic level becomes a condition of possibility of actually recognizing anything like or perceiving anything in the world. Those uh, radically thin impressions in space time that David Hume thought were all the only things that were there. That can't be the only thing that's there because we wouldn't even have an impression of an impression without a self to stitch at least two impressions together. Mm -hmm. Borges comes to the same kind of a conclusion, it also in a, in, but in a, a deeply kind of depressive way, uh, 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 by by saying, ah, yeah, the not personality is nothing. There's there's no way it can be anything else than that. And then he starts saying, well, I'm going to create something like um, uh, what the physicists would call thought experiments about this. I'm going to create characters who confront this, um, and I'm going to push those characters to their extremes. And over and over again, the same thing happens. Over and over again, these characters realize that there is a fundamental anchor that's going to save them from falling into this complete, this hell of nothingness. And it's not God, and it's not a homunculus sitting behind your head that's there, that then becomes a, an infinite regress for another homunculus behind it and everything like that. It is the mere fact that, like Kant said, someone has to be remembering something from one moment to the next uh, in order for there to be something like a moment in time that's that's taken in and that's all it is it's a tiny tiny savior if you will from from hume's hell but it's there and it's ineradicable mm -hmm. and it also on the other hand means that we'll never perfectly know that infinitely thin moment of space time because we're always going to be filtering it through something that's not it that's not what we're trying to know mm -hmm. the self it's an yeah. indelible stain on our knowledge but it's a necessary stain because without it we wouldn't know anything Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I fully agree. It's a great way of saying it because I think, for me, the constancy is critical for mm -hmm. the idea, at least, of the self. Uh, we don't have that. Um, you know, I, I think it's hard to argue against that of sorts. It's hard to describe, but I think it's hard to argue against it. Yeah. Uh, real quick, um, you know, one of my favorites, uh, Nietzsche. You know, you, you mentioned his philosophy as influencing uh, Borges' thinking on time and space. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time on it. it maybe just a small footnote here, but just how how did you see that impact uh, of Nietzsche's thinking on on Borges here? 
So um, uh, Borges was also very influenced by Nietzsche in the same way also that Freud was. These were readers who read Nietzsche and were kind of shocked by him. And then uh, in the similar way to, to, to Kant reading Hume and being shaken, uh, a, a thinker like Nietzsche, if you really read him carefully, it makes you stop and you just you have to wrestle with every it. time, you every time, you have to every confront time. thought every right? time. And so Borges did that, and he confronted in particular the arguments in the of, of the eternal return mm-hmm. of uh, the same. And he has this wonderful, poetic, beautiful passage in which he says, you know, he, he talks about the, the idea of, of the universe necessarily repeating itself, because as long as if, if you imagine a universe made of finite particles, um, um, those that f- finite particles are eventually going to rearrange themselves in this many ways and in this many ways. And one way or the other, it's eventually going to come around to the same again. And that Nietzsche was challenging himself with this notion to say, um, in an a kind of eg- a proto existential way, right? What is the what does the Ubermensch deal deal with that, right? The Ubermensch doesn't try to hide from that. He yay says it. He says, "I am I'm down for that, and I'm down for carrying that burden from here until eternity." Uh, and and Borges liked that, but he also dug into it a little bit. And um, and what he says really quite quite beautifully is, however. How would you, the Ubermensch or, or, or whoever, lost in the universe that was eternally repeating itself, know that it was eternally repeating itself? If, if you are also part of that configuration of particles that's then um, uh, reiterating itself. He says the only way you would know is if there were, as he refers to it, a special angel that was there to count the times that the particles were reconfiguring themselves because otherwise without that special angel this could be the first time or it could be the 500th time or it could be the the 10 to the the 5 millionth time and you would never know and this is an extremely important point um and i'm not saying that nietzsche didn't wasn't aware of this because again like borges nietzsche was a thinker who getting down to the ultimate point of what nietzsche is trying to say involves extraordinary literary uh, uh engagement with his work but it sparked this thought process in borges and that's what was important for me um in a very similar way to kant thinking about heraclitus and everything has changed they both came down to this notion of but something has to stay the same. Uh, and that something that has to be the same is a condition of possibility for us even feeling that that change in the first place, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about, I guess, Einstein and, and, and Heisenberg a little bit here. So this is in both the you know, third and fourth part of the book. And um, I guess the question here is, you say that Einstein informed Heisenberg that, that theory is important mm-hmm. for for you know all the math and and all of the things in physics that you can't just crunch the numbers you got to have a conceptualization you have to have a theory behind it before you just crunch numbers and i guess that and that was particularly instructive i think for for heisenberg i guess that where that becomes interesting is okay we have these facts or we have these data points where do we put it into and the question there is well <laughs> If, if if this idea of reality, if it's not within space and time, and maybe it's it's outside of that construct, how do we understand the reality? Is it just a human construct? Are we essential for for being observers or subjects in the world? How do we understand the theory behind what we can understand about if things are changing, nothing kind of stays the same? Right. Maybe the universe is not what we think it is. That that will, I mean, really just kind of you know turn you upside down and shake you a bunch of times and be like, wait, <laughs> what? What? So how do how do we? I guess you talk about you know Einstein's contribution here of the power of theory and fitting that con- conceptualization, but then what that means about how we understand you know reality and the universe and, and humans in it. So uh, Heisenberg had a, a epic for him um, conversation with uh, with Einstein. And it was early on. I mean, you have to imagine this is a young graduate student having this conversation. And it really it uh, or or the the later ones are a a young assistant professor. And he's talking to, at this point, the consensus, most brilliant man since uh, Isaac Newton. Um, And so that gives you a little bit of a sense of the chutzpah that uh, that Heisenberg would have. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. right, But but they're having these conversations. And Einstein is really you know, Einstein is is a tough interlocutor and he's not going to he's not going to take this lying down. And he's saying, look, um, 
you're, you're on you're on thin ice here because you're essentially saying all we can count on is observations, but you need theory in order to even know what you're observing, uh, and you need to, to actually change the language with which you're 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 you're, you're uh, 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 describing the world in order to continue making sure that you're describing a world because ultimately that's what we're doing out here is describing a world, and I'm afraid, young man, that what you're doing is throwing up your hands and saying, well, I got nothing to say about the world, right? That was essentially Einstein's position. Uh, Heisenberg was so affected by this conversation, which, you know, they didn't get to an end to at that time, uh, uh, the moment they were having it, nor would you expect them to. But it had an an incredible impact. And he then later said it was in some ways reflecting on that conversation that led him at this famous nighttime walk around Faled Park in, uh, in in Copenhagen after he and Bohr had driven each other crazy and Bohr had left him to go skiing. And it's late at night and it's cold and he's walking through the park and it, this, it hits him, this insight that ultimately becomes the paper on the, the uncertainty paper. That um, I, what Einstein had been telling him came home, it sank in, but not in the way that Einstein had intended it, Mm -hmm. Uh, right? Uh, What what Heisenberg realized is, yeah, you do always have to have a theory. And that theory is a picture of the world. But the picture of the world that you have that's making sense of your data isn't necessarily what you're going to find in the end. It's a picture of the world that you put in place in order to make sense of the data. And it doesn't make sense to describe the data without that picture of the world, but you have to also remind yourself that it's a picture of the world, right? That you are making a picture of the world in order to make sense of the data and not imagine that the picture of the world that you're using to make sense of the data is the world that the data is revealing for you. That Einstein, when he says you have to make a theory, what he was really saying all the time was your theory is describing a world that's already out there. But Einstein's own discoveries, Heisenberg would reiterate and reiterate, famously, the uh, general and the special theories of relativity had already shown that something as fundamental as time in the case of special uh, relativity, right, is an instrument of observation. And it doesn't exist there, out there in the world in some kind of an independent way. Einstein himself had already undermined this. And Einstein's famous repost in that uh, conversation was uh, uh, something along the lines of, you should never repeat a good joke twice. (laughs) (laughs) I guess the question is, this is like, for example, like something like, hmm. (laughs) It's 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 sometimes these conversations come up in strange ways. But when you think about time, it doesn't it, it doesn't really exist it's 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 a way in which we organize things right well, but it's, it's, a, it's an organization it, you can you can think in the same way of gravity gravity obviously the 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 idea of gravity in terms of we call it that mm-hmm. we there's 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 a uh let me say there's an activity Mm-hmm. That's going on, and we have all of these ways, and we say, "Well, that's gravity because of it's this and this and this." But we're defining it, naming right. it, saying it, this thing, but experiencing if, it and trying to describe the nature of our experiences. Yeah, but no. that doesn't make it exist because we, we say it it's something that's out there and in, uh, in its own. You know, and what people yeah. in the on the side of the relational theory of, of of quantum mechanics will ultimately say is, "Look, you know." You, a notion of a particle out there with nothing else around it in no relationship to anything else to use our, our idiom today. That's not a thing. <laughs> that's not a thing. It's not that all particles in order to be something that we would call a particle have to have entered in a relationship with something else and an observer. That's what makes them a particle. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it's such a, it's a hard thing because it's like, it does matter. It does, you know, because it, because it's from our vantage point. It's from our, you know, phenomenological experience. So it it does have, you know, kind of some some value there. I guess the question then becomes: How do we all agree upon uh, these notions of the the universe and reality? Because maybe objectively or innately they don't have value or because it needs to be in context or in relation to something. But 
for us as, as, as humans, as living beings, and whether they, they know it or not, other living beings, other organisms on this one planet, in this mm-hmm. one galaxy, in this one universe, you know, that has some value there. But that's not not important either. No, no. And I think the, the answer to the excellent question that you're posing is, frankly, because, and thank goodness for that, we always are in relation to mm. other beings and particles always are in relationship to other particles. And this, this kind of constant relationality is constantly happening. The illusion, right. Is the, uh, the, 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 the fiction is precisely what we then tend to think by t- reversing everything around is the starting point and that all the relations come afterwards, but the fiction mm-hmm. is the other way around. The That's fiction right. is yeah. the idea of the particle out there on its own individualness mm-hmm. and its own. But that never exists. That's right. Yeah. There is no reality without relations. There never has been any reality without relations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fully, fully agree truth. with you. That works at the social level as well as yeah. at the right as at the fundamental level. Yeah. I will. I will say. I mean, you, we and you and I have probably read a lot of the of, of similar things, but I think it it took me a while to get to that realization, and mm-hmm. it's so like it feels almost unnatural. To think yeah. about because your your thought you know you think a certain way for a long time but and it still will be kind of you know a, a mind warp of sorts but it's 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 interesting because then the way you see the world the way you see relationships the way you see a lot of things will be demonstrably different I think in potentially positive uh, ways it should so, be that's my hope yeah <laughs> it should it should be yes yes so. I will not ask you about free will and determinism and the, that whole debate uh, because that's, that's a lot of fun. Read the book for that. that yeah. that's a, that's a, there's a lot there on that one, uh, but it, but it's great. You 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 uh, treat it well. Uh, my last my last question for you is um, so all of this stuff, big questions, uh, different disciplines. Uh, these three guys that um, were were doing important work. What what do you think? And this is really, I guess the you know the the, like, the heart of it is what you want readers to come away with from reading your book, but is how do they teach us this understanding of the nature of reality and then about our own humanity? How, how, how do you want your book to kind of show readers these, these aspects? I think ultimately the lesson there in all of these different realms is that not to prejudice our knowledge of the world and of other people based on the idea that they were there or exist in some independent way before entering in relations. Right. Um, the problem is we always assume that things exist in an, in splendid isolation and then come into relationships with each other. Um, it's a nat- it seems to be a natural way of thinking. This is what Borges also explores. Why do we have this natural way of thinking? And more importantly, how does it affect our relations with other people? Well, what I try to make the point in the book, towards, especially in the conclusion towards the end, is it is, yes, it's apparently a natural way of thinking, at least in in some cultures, at least in majoritarian cultures and cultures of uh, that we find ourselves largely in today. Um, but it is one with its potential downsides, and it can lead to um, all sorts of ramifications in the political and social field that we can shake up and loosen if we can teach ourselves to think in a way that's in fact been taught to us not just by recent social theory or not just by um, loosey-goosey uh, literary uh, thought or something like that, but is in fact congruent with the foundations of the most up-to-date physics that we can possibly uh, imagine and has been uh, a co-traveler of thought in multiple different cultures for millennia as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very nicely said. Well, the book is called The Rigor of Angels. Borges Heisenberg, Kant, and the Ultimate Nature of Reality. Uh, and this is through Pantheon, right? Which is uh, through uh, Penguin uh, Penguin Press or whatever. Uh, Penguin yeah. Random House. Yep. Penguin Random House, yeah. And uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. I, I was looking forward to it and it did not disappoint. Uh, I wanted to, you know, wrestle with you on these issues and see where we can find it. And it was very edifying for me and, and hopefully for you and all the listeners. So a big, big, big thanks. And, and I hope everyone gets out there to get your book. Thanks to you, Xavier. I really enjoyed our conversation as well. All right. Thank you. Take care.